Germany made significant contributions to the development of the parachute and also in mastering the techniques of parachute jumping. During the First World War, some brave men successfully used parachutes to land behind the enemy lines. Restricted after the war, the German armed forces were of course in no position to compete with the experimental programs being pursued by America and Russia. America had been the scene of important work in the field of parachute development since the 1880s. Although parachute jumping in that country, more for reasons of sensation-seeking, was presented as entertainment rather than for any tactical use. In April 1928, a sergeant and 10 men of the Army's Air Weapons School carried out the first mass jump in history. It's no wonder, therefore, that the Russians sought to follow this American example. Even though the Americans were on the right track from the very beginning, and even though some military leaders recognized the importance of parachute troops, supporters of a parachute corps were unable to push their plans. The Russian armed forces were the first to recognize the military value of parachute troops. Russia conducted an experimental program with jumps under the widest range of conditions, such as from the maximum and minimum possible heights. From the beginning, all experiments and tests were aimed at military applications. Nevertheless, Russia was incapable of exploiting this lead, as the organization of the military at this time was in complete disarray. The first use of parachute troops by Soviet Russia was during the Finnish campaign, but this proved weak and ineffective. In England, it wasn't until 1940 that a parachute force was established. Although the English stressed the value of parachutes as saboteurs, there were no serious parachute operations undertaken in the first three years of the war. From about 1935, the success enjoyed in maneuvers by the Russian parachute troops attracted the attention of almost all major states. However, most progressed no farther in their own development other than with experimental units. The revitalized new Germany, however, not only recognized the importance of this new weapon, but also possessed the strength to make it its own. Orders were issued for the formation of a German parachute corps. Hermann Goering, one of the leaders of Hitler's new Germany, had recognized the importance of paratroopers and was a strong advocate of establishing a specialist parachute unit within his elite police force. In 1933, when he was made supreme commander of the Luftwaffe, he converted one of the police units into an elite air force unit. On the 29th of January 1936, he directed this unit to be trained and equipped in a parachute role for use in future airborne operations. A Luftwaffe parachute training school was established. In the spring of 1937, the Army High Command, OKH, also obtained authority to create a parachute rifle company. As the Army had no para-training establishment of its own, the soldiers were sent to the Luftwaffe School at Stendel. The Army unit was expanded to battalion strength in June 1938, the full Fulsham Infantry Battalion. It was becoming clear by then that an amalgamation of the two separately controlled units was necessary. Directions were given that all of the future preparation and execution of battle plans, including transportation of airborne forces, would come under Luftwaffe directives. The army would then assume command of that force once contact had been established by the paratroopers with ground forces. On the 1st of July 1938, the Luftwaffe High Command ordered that the para, glider and air transport units under its command be formed into the 7th Flieger Division. Major General Kurt Student was named as the new commander. In January 1939, the Parachute Infantry Battalions of the Army, which although operated independently from the 7th Flieger Division, were brought under Luftwaffe command. Soon afterwards, on the 20th of April 1939, the new Fallschirmjäger units for the first time participated in the parade to mark the Führer's birthday to the applause of the crowds. The Parachute Corps, which demanded the utmost of all its members, consisted exclusively of volunteers. Anyone who decided to join this elite corps was made aware that physical, spiritual and moral demands would be made of him, which were greater than those made of almost every other branch of the armed forces. The notices also went on to state, after a long and demanding period of training, only those in top physical and mental condition should apply.
Men lacking a solid character, perhaps only driven by a lust for adventure, have no place in the parachute corps. Training did not take place in a classroom. It took place in aircraft hangars and on landing fields. The hangar floor would almost be covered with thick mats on which the recruits would be taught the techniques of rolling. They were taught to dive over six men and then turn their landing into a roll. There would be a tower with a ladder. The paratrooper trainees would jump from a height of two meters and again learn how to turn their landing into a roll. They would also practice jumping into a net to simulate leaving an aircraft. The more advanced trainees would hang from a suspension system that uses the same harness which would later hold them in their parachutes. They were raised up in this device and swung back and forth as on a swing. It was necessary for a trainee to maintain the correct posture for a landing. Close to the hangar would be a section of the Ju-52. Here, the recruits would practice jumping from the aircraft. The trainees were taught what they must do when the command, get ready, is given. How they should attach their snap hooks to the static line and hold fast to the handles of the jump door before they hurled themselves into the storm wing produced by the propellers. The trainees would also use other JUs, which, although no longer airworthy, still have their engines and undercarriage. These were called wind donkeys. Their sole purpose was to create wind. The wind filled parachutes and its force would blow the recruits along the ground. While being dragged over the field by the parachute, they were taught how to try to get to their feet in order to run around the silk as quickly as possible so that it collapsed and could no longer be caught by the wind. Packing hangar and parachute stores formed a complex of their own. Hundreds of special long tables were required. Each paratrooper had to learn to pack his own chute. Servicing, drying and caring for the parachutes takes a great deal of space. To the beginner, packing at first seemed an arcane skill. The process of turning the maze of silk and lines into the small package of a ready-to-use parachute was a complicated one. However, after a few days, using the Wehrmacht's tested teaching method, a trainee who had first required perhaps half a day to pack a parachute could accomplish the task in less than an hour. Constant observation by the responsible superior, as well as precisely specified interim checks at the end of each step of the packing process, ensured that each parachute was packed according to regulations. In front of the hangar was the place where the rules of an equally comprehensive and meticulous training process proved themselves, the jump field. Young paratroopers making their first jump, experiencing the most gripping experience the German Air Force could give its soldiers, jumping from the sky. Those who have experienced it are, like all paratroopers, sworn to this corps with all the enthusiasm of a young man who saw a danger facing him, approached it courageously and realized that for the brave, it was in fact no danger. After training at the parachute school, the new paratrooper would be sent to an operational unit where he was given the final polish before going into action and receiving the esteemed emblem with the diving eagle. The paratrooper was taught to use a wide range of weapons and equipment which would enable him not just to take an enemy position but also to hold that position stubbornly until relieved by ground troops. The armament and equipment used by the paratrooper were designed specifically for this role after having been thoroughly tested and evaluated. Over the usual Luftwaffe uniform, the soldier would wear the familiar outfit consisting of shirt and pants. His hands and knees were protected by jumper's gloves and knee guards. Foot wrappings and special boots were intended to prevent injuries while jumping. The paratrooper helmet had a thick foam rubber lining. The shape of the steel helmet, which differed from the standard armed forces model, immediately identified the soldier as a paratrooper. The belt, the gas mask, the cartridge pouches, two rations bags and two canteens completed the equipment carried on the body. Packed in their own containers, the weapons accompanied the men to the scene of the action and were dropped with them. 
Officers and non-commissioned officers who instructed one course after another were performing a highly responsible service. Although the instructors had to be among the most capable of the paratroopers, never or rarely were they permitted to see combat. The men who were trained to be paratroopers by the instructors experienced combat in the field, something their instructors experienced only in theory. True, the instructors knew that their work contributed to the winning of battles, and it was often said that no paratrooper ever forgot his instructor. In the toughest actions, the example of the instructor appears before a fighting man, and remembering him often helps master even the most difficult situations. In addition to the weapons which the paratrooper would need to fight, his most important helper would be the parachute, which carried him to the earth after he jumped from the transport aircraft. The designers of the German service parachute, which was used by the entire parachute corps, did everything humanly possible to ensure the safety of the jumper. Only the very best materials were used in the factories. Each parachute underwent numerous checks before it reached the machines where it received its final form. Several years of testing and experiments at the parachute test station at Stendel resulted in the development of a reliable parachute for military purposes, which was based on the parachutes originally used for civil aviation. Designated the RZ-1, the first operational parachute, was a semicircular back-mounted parachute with 28 sections with a surface area of 56 square meters. With a jump height of 100 meters, the parachute was designed to open automatically by use of a static line after falling approximately 30 meters from the aircraft. There was no reserve parachute. Frequent strength tests ensured that the parachute could bear several times the weight of a grown man. Troopers transport aircraft, the Junkers Ju-52, has become so well known, not just in Germany but throughout the entire world, that any words would be superfluous. The German command had realized at an early stage what great value this aircraft would have in wartime as a transporter of troops and material, and soon ensured that it was placed into quantity production. In this way, it was possible to launch and successfully execute large-scale parachute operations. Obviously, this machine was used for more than just being the standard aircraft for carrying parachute troops into combat. It also performed invaluable services in delivering all manner of supplies, whether food, munitions, weapons or fuel. Countless German soldiers owe their lives and health to the Ju-52 air ambulance. The creators of the Parachute Corps also came to realize that its special character and purpose would also require specialized medical personnel. In each parachute operation, therefore, sufficiently large medical units were dropped, and these cared for the sick and wounded during the heaviest fighting. When the Germans marched into Poland on September the 1st, 1939, the Second World War began, and the German parachute troops were involved from the beginning. In that brief campaign, neither 7th Flieger Division or the 22nd Air Landing Divisions had been used for the roles in which they were trained. This was mainly to preserve the secret of a German airborne force. Although there was no parachute operation, there were air landing operations by the 1st Battalion of 2nd Regiment on the airfield at Devlen, and the 2nd Battalion was air landed onto other airfields, as well as the Dukla Pass. The orders were to support the infantry and to secure the airfields for the Luftwaffe. In every case, the missions were flown to speed the dissolution of the Polish army and to prevent its senior officers escaping by air to Allied countries. The very first German paratrooper to fall in action was at Wola Galuska, fighting against a Polish artillery regiment. This was to be the first of a great many more throughout the war. Following the capitulation of Warsaw, Hitler turned his attentions towards Norway. He needed to block the threat of Britain and France outflanking Germany from the north. To capture it, he launched a major operation, and to hold it, he committed large numbers of men who otherwise would have been employed on the western or eastern fronts. Operation Verzerubung was to be a simultaneous attack on both Norway and Denmark. There was to be the highest level of secrecy about the operation, as it would involve much of the invasion force being carried by ship through seas which were patrolled by British submarines. 
The plan was to attack the ports where the army would be disembarked to go into action against the Norwegian army. Another part of the plan was to capture the airfields quickly and simultaneously, and this is where the paratroopers would see action. On the 9th of April 1940, Germany attacked. The German Navy opened her guns on six of Norway's principal ports. The German army was disembarked to fight the Norwegian army. To secure the airfields for the Luftwaffe in southern Norway and Denmark, parachutists from the 1st Battalion of the 1st Jäger Regiment dropped onto the airfields, secured them, and held them long enough for the second wave of the Junkers aircraft to airland further troops. Simultaneously, four strategic airfields were hit, captured and secured by one single battalion. This had been the first active test of the new airborne force and it had proved itself magnificently. The campaign in Norway continued using army ground forces, and whilst this was going on, the mass of the German army was preparing for a massive offensive in the west, Operation Gell. The role of the airborne forces was vital to the successful opening moves of Operation Gelb, and it could be claimed that the success of the operation was dependent upon the ability of fewer than 500 men, the soldiers of Assault Battalion Koch. It had been determined as early as mid-1939 that there was a need for an elite specialist unit within the airborne force for strategic assault. The men selected would have to be willing to undertake operations involving the highest risk, and they would need specialist training and equipment. It was also determined that it was essential if this assault force was to successfully attack a target and take it by complete surprise that they would need to be carried to the target as one entire detachment, as a single concentrated force. carrier could only be an aircraft's fuselage, but not that of conventional aircraft, as they were too noisy and had a high landing speed. The solution was a silent cheap glider, which could arrive at the target in complete secrecy, the DFS-230 type. Blocking the planned advance of the German army into Belgium was the Belgian fortress Eben Emel on the Albert Canal. Its capture was vital to the success of the complete operation. Students' paratroops were tasked with seizing and neutralizing the fort and other strategic Dutch airfields and bridges. On the 10th of May, 11 DFS-230 type gliders carrying a total of 85 paratroopers forming the Granite Group swooped towards their objective, the Eben Emel Fort. A further 90 paratroopers and 10 gliders forming the Eisen Group had landed on the Cannes Bridge. The Beaton Group, with 122 paratroopers and 11 gliders, advanced on the Bronhoven Bridge. While Stahl Group, with 92 paratroopers and 10 gliders, were attacking the Veldvoselt Bridge. In command of the four groups of paratroopers was Halpern Koch. One of the enemy's most dangerous fortifications had been put out of action. The bridges, destruction of which would have seriously held up the German advance, fell into German hands intact. 
This tiny force overran, defeated and captured a vastly superior number of defenders, or at least held them in check until units of the German army arrived and relieved the paratroopers. Belgium's defeat came so quickly that the English and French had no time to come to her aid as they had planned. Neutralization of the Ibn Amel fort and the capture of the Albert Canal bridges were a resounding success. This method of deploying armed men into an objective was at the time a revolutionary breakthrough in the art of warfare. With the fall of Belgium, Germany continued her advance across the Netherlands. Over Holland, a further 4,000 paratroopers of 7 Flieger Division and 12,000 men of the 22 Infantry Division were employed to capture bridges and airfields. The use of paratroopers and air-landed forces which were under the personal command of Lieutenant General Student upset the enemy's plans from the outset. A huge air transport operation was carried out under the command of Major Conrad and Lieutenant Major Vilka. On the 10th of May 1940, paratroopers descended on the Wilhaven airfield, captured it and made it possible for the troop transports to land. Other elements took the Neue Maas bridges in Rotterdam, the Udemaas bridge near Dordrecht, and the major bridges near Moerdijk. These forces were commanded by Major Brouwer, all the captured positions held out for days against heavy attacks. The paratroopers paralyzed enemy movements, tied down very strong forces, and prevented the bridges from being blown. As they had done in Belgium, in Holland too, their efforts enabled the German army to advance through the country unhindered. The use of German parachute troops thus played a significant role in the surrender of Belgium and Holland, and ultimately also created the necessary conditions for the rapid defeat of France. After the victories in the east, the north and in the west, parachute forces made a decisive contribution to a campaign for the first time in history. From a weapon whose practicality was still in dispute in the rest of the world, German research, energy and organization had created a core which had now demonstrated that it led the world in its field. June 1940 until February 1941, 7 Flieger Division was completely reorganized. Convalescing from a head wound suffered in the Western Campaign, Student was promoted to the rank of General de Flieger and the command of 7 Flieger Division was provisionally passed to Major General Putzier. 
The creation of two new regiments was initiated, FJR-3 and the Luftlander Sturm Regiment. In January 1941, when Student had recovered and resumed his command, he decided to create 11 Flieger Corps, but the two previously mentioned units were added to the corps. On the 6th of April 1941, Hitler's armed divisions, supported by air cover from the Luftwaffe, invaded Yugoslavia. The Yugoslav forces were ill-prepared for such an onslaught and were quickly overrun. The Germans entered the capital Belgrade on the 12th of April. Five days later, Yugoslavia surrendered. The next objective, Greece, held out just a little longer, but very soon that country too was overrun and the British forces began a rapid evacuation. After the capture of Saloniki and Larissa, one of the most important strategic points was Corinth. The small bridges over the canal there constituted the sole line of communication, including road, rail and telephone, between the Peloponnese and the mainland. The point had to be of great importance to the British retreat. In order to prevent the British from escaping through the Peloponnese, Germany launched a massive parachute operation on the 26th of April, aimed at capturing the most strategic bridge in the Corinth Isthmus. With the Luftwaffe attacking the ground forces from the air, the paratroopers captured 250 British soldiers, then with the aid of air-landed troops, they destroyed the bridge. By midday, with the surrender of the Greek battalion, Corinth had fallen into the hands of the 7th and 8th Company paratroopers, and the escape route for the remaining British troops was sealed. The next day, they took Argos and Noplia. This resulted in the further surrender of almost 2,000 men, leaving the paratroopers to hold the area until the 28th of April, when ground reinforcements arrived to clean up any last remaining pockets of resistance. The British had thus been driven from the mainland. The sole part of Greece still in British hands was Crete. They knew that in German hands it would be very dangerous for their position in Africa and in the Mediterranean. On the other hand, in the hands of the English, this bulwark in the Mediterranean posed a severe threat to the Greek mainland and German-Italian shipping routes across the Mediterranean. The island therefore had to be taken, even though strong defence by the English had to be expected. Without the parachute troops, the mission could not be carried out. They were therefore assembled in Greece and went into action from there on the morning of the 20th of May, 1941. This was going to be the first time in history when the revolutionary concept of capturing an island by airborne and parachute forces had been attempted. For the assault, General Student formed groups which jumped and fought under Major General Meindl with the Malems airfield. In the west of the island, under Lieutenant General Supan, and after his death in a crash, in the Major Heydrich near Karnia. The third group was led by Major Sturm near Rethymnon, and finally the fourth under Major Brower near Heraklia. 500 Ju-52s were employed to carry the first wave of paratroopers. Only seven were lost, and there were a great many more returned to Greece, showing the marks of bullets and shell fire from the British anti-aircraft batteries. The second wave followed later in the day, following the Stuka dive bombers to raid the island. German intelligence about the enemy situation in Crete was inaccurate, in spite of constant daylight air reconnaissance. There was no clear idea of how many British troops were garrisoned there and how many reinforcements had been brought there after the retreat from Greece. They did know, however, that the British forces would resist any such attack with great force.
jumping at different places into the midst of a superior enemy, the latter's movements were immediately severed at the main points and paralyzed. The main enemy airfield at Melem was taken in heavy fighting. Beginning on the 21st of May, Alpine troops were landed, and together with them, the island was rolled up from the west. On the 27th of May, Karnia, the capital of Crete, was taken, Rechlinon on the 29th of May, and Heraklion on the 30th of May. On the 2nd of June 1941, the conquest of Crete was largely concluded. For the first time in history, an island, and moreover a strongly fortified and stoutly defended one, had fallen to an attack from the sky. This was the elite German forces' most spectacular success of the Second World War. Not only had the parachute troops held their own against a vastly superior force, but in the end, they defeated it. The cost had been heavy, and they had paid dearly for their victory. Almost one in four of the 20,000 paratroopers who dropped on the island had perished. A further 3,400 were wounded. And for the enemy, apart from equally heavy losses in dead and wounded, they also lost a further 12,000 men, which had been captured. The German forces also released 14,000 Italian prisoners of war. into areas held by the enemy, the Parachute Corps proved that it totally deserved the trust placed in it and that it was the decisive instrument of the German command that the latter thought it was. In Germany, the units were brought up to strength and soon they were ready for action again. On the Eastern Front, when Bolshevism thought it could defeat the German army with the help of General Winter, the parachute troops were committed to fight off the mass assaults by the Asiatics, together with their comrades of the army. At the hot spots of these tremendous winter battles, the men of the parachute, this time as ground troops, renewed the fame they had earned on the various fronts. Wherever they were, the Soviets received a bloody nose. They launched powerful counterattacks which retook important strong points. The Russian winter was no more able to diminish their thirst for action than had the tropical heat on Crete. Everywhere they performed truly heroic deeds. They stood shoulder to shoulder with the troops of the various Wehrmacht elements, and their selfless actions saw to it that the Soviets did not achieve their goal, the overrunning of the German front. The commander-in-chief of one army in whose formations parachute troops fought said of them, superior in their discipline, toughness and training, with an exemplary spirit of cooperation they fought, led and triumphed at the side of the army. The brief summer months were used to retrain the units and bring them up to strength. For most of the corps, this took place in northern France. One young new recruit in 1941 was Hans Tesk. 
went on to receive the Iron Cross first class for his efforts as a paratrooper. I was 17 years old and brauchte uh, the genehmigung meines Vaters. I was 17 years old and needed my father's permission to become a soldier. I was in the First World War and as an infantry. And there was no genehmigung, because I was a false soldier. My father was an infantryman in World War I, and he didn't want to give me the permission as I wanted to become a parachutist. I started to complain and was difficult, which was very annoying for my father as we worked in the same company. Finally, my father gave me his permission, but only to become a soldier in the Air Force working on the ground. My parents were amazed when two weeks later I had already received my call-up papers. Denn ich brauchte seine Genehmigung nicht mehr. Denn wenn man Soldat ist, braucht man die Genehmigung des Eltern, der Eltern nicht mehr. I became a soldier in the 7th Regiment. As soon as I was a soldier, I applied to be a paratrooper, as I didn't need any further signatures from my father for this. Nach Hildesheim versetzt. In Hildesheim wurde eine neue once you are a soldier, you don't need any more permission from your parents. I then became a paratrooper and was transferred to Hildesheim. They were setting up a new regiment, the 5th Parachute Regiment, consisting of the best of the regiment which were still fighting in Russia. Alles flach und äh, äh, der Dienst ist sehr hart. Da sind wir dann von. Äh, we were transferred to a training Grobborn area in Grobborn. Da, äh, the training äh, area was quite awful. Nothing a soldier really likes. Wir sind versetzt worden und kamen nach Frankreich in den Raum von St. Lo. Das war 1942 im Mai. It was like und, a desert, äh, cold and flat, and the work was Monate very hard. In Frankreich geblieben wurden dann für einen Einsatz nach Malta. After having stayed in Grobborn for four to five weeks, we were transferred to France in May of 1942, and there we were trained for a planned mission in Malta. Im November 42 landeten die Briten und Amerikaner in französisch Nordafrika. In the meantime, in November 1942, the British and Americans landed in French North Africa. Instead of taking part in occupying the rest of France, we had to leave and were sent to Italy, where we were equipped and then went on to Tunis. Under the command of Major General Ramke, a parachute brigade was formed that was sent to North Africa. It was assigned a sector on the southern wing of the El Alamein position, which bordered the Katara Depression. In attack and defense under the hardest living conditions in the African desert sun, German parachute troops lived up to the expectations placed in them. We had then also one British Panzer Spielwagen. We had stolen a few British tanks. The British were caught in our trap, and we took their tanks for our own purposes. We did not remove the yellow flags and drove into the area of the British paratroopers. Fleißig am Winken war. Er freute sich, dass doch noch britische Panzer da sind. They sent a man over to us who waved at us and shouted and seemed very pleased to see that there were still British tanks around. Da haben wir den zurückgeschickt zu General Frost, Oberst Frost, wie er damals war. 
Er sollte sich aufgeben, er, ist, er hat keinen Zweck. Er hat den Mann zurückgeschickt und sagt, However, when he came closer, he realized that we were not British. We told him to tell General Frost to surrender, which he did. General Frost sent the man back, who greeted us again with a two-finger salute, and told us that we should carry on and that he wasn't giving up. Zu den britischen Stellung zurückgekommen. Dann hatten wir äh, britische Gegner in äh, Buarade, das war im nächsten Monat. We were fighting for the next two days äh, and General ersten, Frost lost many men. Die da äh, ankamen, waren das London Irish Fusilier Regiment und äh, äh, die äh, waren sehr. We took over 200 hart, prisoners from his battalion. Starkköpfig und uh, die hatten uns sehr viel Schwierigkeiten bereitet. In Buarada hatten wir sehr schwere Kämpfe. Da waren in January we had British opponents in Burad. Uh, es war wie im Ersten Weltkrieg. Jede Seite hatte Stellung, Stellung und uh, there was heavy fighting. It was like in World War I. Every side had its certain position. Tunisian soil consists mostly of rocks, which means that it was almost impossible to dig in. Then, these kämpfe dauerten bis zum. The fighting lasted until the 28th of February, when we attacked the British positions. An Angriff machten auf die britischen Stellung. However, the British 8th Army were driving the Germans back. It soon became necessary for the German-Italian Panzer Army to withdraw to the west away from the numerically superior and advancing Allied enemy. The paratroopers succeeded in making a daring breakout to reach the safety of Rommel's army. This time it wasn't a tank that they borrowed from the British. Completely surrounded by British forces and exhausted from combat, short of food supplies, and more importantly in the hot sun of the desert without any water, the paratroopers faced a bleak prospect of surrender or escape and evade on foot. In true paratrooper style, in the course of the breakout, the unit captured enough enemy vehicles that the brigade, which was not a motorized unit, was able to drive straight across the desert in British trucks to reach the army. With captured British drivers, they even passed British convoys. Seven days later, they reached the safety of Marsa Matruk. The Führer rewarded this daring act by awarding the unit's leader, Major General Ramke, the oak leaves to go with the Knight's Cross he had won on Crete. In the months that followed, the paratroopers continued their fight in North Africa, with the Para Corps Engineer Battalion being deployed. It was here that Hans Tesk had been awarded the Iron Cross for his brave efforts in rescuing wounded soldiers, not German, but British soldiers, whilst under heavy fire. He ended up, along with a few surviving paratroopers, as a prisoner of war as the German forces were finally driven out of Africa. But prior to that, they had fought relentlessly against a vastly superior army in terms of machines and men until the bitter end, almost to the very last man.
In July 1943, the 1st Parachute Division were dropped onto the island of Sicily. This was a counter-defensive move to block the British 8th Army, which was advancing swiftly into the Catania Plain and was intending to seize Messina. Although there were Axis forces already in eastern Sicily, they were too weak to defend it against such a large enemy force. The paratroopers were sent in to reinforce them. One battalion were dropped close to the city of Catania to secure numerous key points. These included the Primasol Bridge along the front line alongside the Sumeto River. Another group dropped down onto the airport at Catania and took up their position south of the Primasol Bridge. The bridge was heavily defended by the British 1st Parachute Brigade and a fierce battle took place for the control of the bridge. The men from the 1st Battalion were veteran soldiers who knew the terrain well. They fought stubbornly for every foot of ground and inflicted heavy losses on the enemy. In September 1943, paratroopers were dropped near to the Italian headquarters of Monte Rotondo. They were under orders from Hitler to disarm the troops of his former ally in the garrison at Rome and to prepare a covert operation to liberate Mussolini from captivity. There was a determined resistance at Monte Rotondo, which was to the northeast of Rome, where the headquarters of the Italian army was situated. But with a swift, decisive assault, the building was soon in German hands and hostilities were ceased. The Italians surrendered and within a day the situation was under control and calm had been restored. entered the city of Rome on the 9th of September with no further resistance, showing once again that the highly trained German paratroop units were capable of delivering sharp and sudden blows to the enemy. At dawn on the 12th of September, paratroopers were landed by gliders on the airfield of Monteca di Mare. Their mission was to rescue Mussolini, who was being held captive in a hotel at the top of the mountain at Gran Sasso. of access were by climbing or by using the cable car system. Whilst the glider force landed at the top of... If Crete was the epic parachute attack, then Monte Cassino was undoubtedly the epic defence by the Parachute Corps. For neither massive artillery bombardment, heavy air raids, nor direct infantry assault could dislodge these stubborn yet brave defenders. As each storm of explosives ended, they had come out of their shelters and hedgerows and counterattacked again and again, wreaking carnage on the advancing allies exposed in the hills below. For three months, they held their position. It was only when, by the sheer weight of numbers, that the allies managed to get a foothold and plant their flag on Monte Cassino did these brave men crumble. And yet, even when they did not surrender, they managed to withdraw unscathed and escape to safety. Yet now, at the end of 1944, with the tide of war running against Germany, the Parachute Corps was once again at the forefront of the fighting. The British forces have returned once again to Europe, only this time they were heavily reinforced by the armies of their American, Free French and Canadian allies. The Parachute Divisions were put into battle in an endeavour to contain the invading Allied armies. When the Allies had landed at Normandy, German parachute formations were amongst the first to be committed. They held out at Brest under the command of Ramke until US troops got within 100 metres of their command post. Student was given command of a new force impressively titled the 1st Parachute Army, which was entrusted with holding the front line of the Low Countries between Antwerp and Maastricht. Yet this force of 30,000 men were not the same men of the original airborne units. They no longer had the same standards. The new formations were airborne in name only and were largely filled with remnants of the Luftwaffe field divisions, ground crews that no longer had any aircraft to service, and anyone else in Air Force uniform who could hold a rifle. 
But there was still a small nucleus of the old veterans who'd been drafted in from the old battalions. These men fought with distinction until the last days of the war. They fought against the Allied landings in the Arnhem Corridor. They fought ferociously in Normandy. In the Ardennes in December 1944, they fought in small pockets against the advancing US troops and tank regiments. In the battle for Saint-Nazaire, one paratrooper recalled, in the pocket of Saint-Nazaire, a German paratroop unit was surrounded and deprived of support. The paratroopers could only rely on themselves as the whole world seemed to be united against them. Bearing a flag of truce, an American came to them and told them to surrender. But the Major replied, the German parachute force never surrenders. By this time in the war, the time had come for all German troops to retreat. But still, the paratroop regiment stubbornly held on, delaying the advancing armies as long as possible before pulling back. This highly trained, highly effective force of veterans, and some of the new recruits who'd never even seen a parachute, roused fear amongst the Allied forces, and at the same time earned a level of respect as one of Germany's most elite fighting forces. The men who wore the badge of the Storming Eagle.